Hello students. This lesson is the first of a series of three lessons on inverse trigonometry. We begin with a review of inverse functions. Consider the two different functions below. Complete each table and determine whether each function has an inverse function. Where possible, give the domain and range of each function and its inverse function. Now in each of these cases, let's go ahead and assume that the horizontal axis is x and that the vertical axis is y. Focusing on the graph on the left, when x is 1, we intersect the graph up here at a height of 6. Shift x to 3, and we get a height of 5. Shift x to 4, and we have a point with a height of 2. Shift x to 7, and we have a y coordinate of 0. And we do have y as a function of x because this graph passes the vertical line test. There is no more than one y coordinate corresponding to any given x coordinate. If y is a function of x, then we call the x coordinate the input and the y coordinate the output. Looking at the graph on the right, the vertical line test passes, meaning that there is no vertical line that intersects the graph more than once at a time, so there will only ever be one y-coordinate for any given x-coordinate. When x is 1, the output is 6. By the time x gets to 3, the output has decreased to 5. When x is 4, y is 2. But this time, as x increases past 4, the y-coordinates increase up until we get to x equals 7 and y equals 5 again. But this is also a function of x, in which case we think of x as the input and y as the output. Now for each of these cases, what we want to consider next is whether we can think of x as a function of y, meaning think of the y's as the inputs and the x's as the outputs. Now let's look at the case on the right first. We've already established that y is a function of x, meaning that any x-coordinate will yield only one corresponding y-coordinate. So when x is 1, we only got 6 back we did not get multiple values for y. When x was 3, we got only one output back, 5. We did not get multiple outputs. In fact, this is true for any x in the domain of this function. Now let's look at this backwards, where we think of y as the inputs. Notice a problem here with two different 5s. In one case, an input of 5 yields an output of 3, but then down below, an input of 5 outputs an x value of 7. So if we're looking from y to x, there is one input, 5, that has multiple outputs, 3 and 7, for x. Now because of that, we can say that x is not a function of y. Consider a horizontal line test. If you scan the graph of the horizontal line, you can see that there are many horizontal lines, for example here, that intersect the graph more than once. Thus, there would be a single y-coordinate corresponding to multiple x-coordinates, meaning that x is not a function of y. Now let's look at the case on the left. As you scan the graph with horizontal lines, you never intersect the graph more than once at a time. Thus, for any value of y, there would never be more than one corresponding value for x. So in this case, we can say that both y is a function of x and we can say that x is a function of y. This graph passes both the vertical line test and the horizontal line test. Such functions are known as one-to-one -one functions, whereas the case on the right this was only a function in one direction, meaning y was a function of x, but x was not a function of y, so this is not a one-to-one -one function. Because x is a function of y, we could say that x is equal to some function, I'll use g now, a new letter, of y. But because this relationship is the foundation for both this notation and this notation, then we use a special notation for this g. We say it's f, referring to the fact that this was f, but then with a negative one power on it. This notation means the inverse function of f. You can think of it as the function that undoes the effects of the function f. So for example, the function f turned 1 into 6. You inputted 1 and outputted 6. Function f turned 3 into 5, turned 4 into 2, and turned 7 into 0. And of course, there are more points on this graph. These are just four points that are highlighted. Now the inverse function would reverse this. It would input 6 for y and output 1 for x would input 5 for y and output 3 for x, input 2 for y and output 4 for x, and finally input 0 for y and output 7 for x. So the roles of input and output switch for the inverse function. If I say what is f of 3, f is referring to this notation, therefore x is the input variable, it's called the argument of the function as well. f inputs x and outputs y, so f of 3 would be this 5. But if I say, what is f inverse of 2? f inverse is a function that reverses what f does. 
So F inverse inputs Y coordinates and returns the X coordinates corresponding to that Y coordinate. So two gets inputted and four gets outputted. So F inverse of two would be the four. Now where possible, give the domain and range of each function and its inverse function. So in the case here on the left, D sub F will stand for the domain of F. F is a function that inputs X coordinates. So we need to look at this function and ask ourselves what are the X coordinates for which this function is defined. Those would be the x-coordinates between 1 and 7, inclusive because of the solid endpoints. So in interval notation, we would say the domain is the interval from 1 to 7 with brackets. The range of f, we'll say capital R sub f, are the outputs of the f function. And the f function outputs y-coordinates. And the lowest y-coordinate is 0, and then all the y-coordinates are possible up to height 6, both endpoints included. Now because the roles of input and output switch when considering the inverse function, then we expect the domain and the range to switch. Therefore, the domain of the inverse function will be equal to the range of the original function, which is the interval from 0 to 6 inclusive, because f inverse inputs y coordinates, and the y's vary from 0 to 6. The range of f inverse are the outputs of the inverse function, and the inverse function outputs x coordinates, and those possible x coordinates are 1 to 7. So these two will always be the same, and these two will always be the same. In general, you should think of the domain of a function not as all the x-coordinates, but of all the inputs, and the range of a function, not as all y-coordinates, but of all outputs, because sometimes the role of x and y switch. Now in the case on the right, this was not a one-to-one -one function, so we say this function has no inverse function, or we can simply say f inverse does not exist, or dne. So we can only give the domain and range of the original function. The domain is still one to seven, those are the inputs, or x-coordinates, but the range will be different this time. The lowest y-coordinate is at height 2, and then we go as high as height 6. So the range of f will be the interval from 2 to 6, inclusive of both endpoints. In summary, all 1 to 1 functions have inverse functions. The roles of domain and range switch when comparing f and f inverse, and the inverse function is a function that reverses the effects of the original function. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Consider the equation below sine of x is equal to negative 1 half. Solve the equation for all values of x. So x in this position is an argument of a trig function, meaning that you should interpret x as an angle. So this is like saying, at what angles will the sine be negative 1 half? The unit circle will help us with this. Recall that the sine is the second coordinate in the unit circle. So I'm going to highlight all the points where the second coordinate is negative 1 half. So this height of negative 1 half will be obtained at two angles on the unit circle, 7 pi 6 and 11 pi 6 in radians, or 210 degrees and 330 degrees. I'll give my answers in degrees first. Now these are not the only possible answers, because the unit circle only shows one rotation counterclockwise from 0 to 360. So if you start at 210 degrees and rotate another 360, that'll take you to 570 degrees. You could do something similar with a 330, rotate another 360 and produce another angle. You could do this forever by continuing to increase by 360 degrees, beginning with either of these two different angles. You can also rotate clockwise. So if you start with 210 degrees and rotate clockwise 360 degrees, then you would calculate the new angle by doing 210 minus 360, which takes us to negative 150 degrees, which when in standard position means you start on the positive x-axis and go clockwise 150 degrees. There are really infinitely many angles where this occurs. To write all of them at once, you can say something like the following, 210 degrees plus any multiple of 360 degrees, where n is an integer. This gives you all angles that begin at 210 degrees and do a full rotation either clockwise or counterclockwise to give you all other possible coterminal angles in the third quadrant. Or you can begin at 330 degrees. To this, add any multiple of 360. This is how you would present your answer in degrees. But moving forward, we're going to be presenting answers in radians. So in this case, 210 degrees is 7 pi 6 radians. And you add to this any multiple of 2 pi. 2 pi is a full rotation. Or for the fourth quadrant answer, we would say 11 pi 6 plus any integer multiple of 2 pi. These are the ways to describe all the points. Quadrant 3 points in the first description, and then quadrant 4 points in the second description. Now, if I use the graph below to help answer this question, we're trying to find the values of x where the sine of x will be negative 1 half. So in other words, we want the output, in the, which in this case would be a y-coordinate, to be negative 1 half. You can see that this horizontal line is going to intersect the sine wave infinitely many times. 
The unit circle covers a range from 0 to 2 pi. So focusing on these x-coordinates, you can see that there are two points of intersection. This first one is 7 pi 6 as the x value, and the sine of that angle is the negative 1 half. And the second point in the window from 0 to 2 pi is the angle 11 pi 6, and again, output value of negative 1 half. If you begin with this x value and go right or left by 2 pi, it'll take you to an x value for which the statement is true again. And you can do this forever in both directions. Or you could begin with a fourth quadrant angle and go right or left 2 pi, and it'll take you to x values that also satisfy the equation. So this location on the unit circle corresponds to this location in our xy graph of the sine function. And then this description gives us all quadrant three points of intersection. And then this fourth quadrant location corresponds to this x value, and all fourth quadrant answers are given by this description. Okay, now solve the equation for all values of x in the interval from negative pi halves to pi halves. Negative pi halves is 90 degrees rotated clockwise, and pi halves is 90 degrees rotated counterclockwise from the x-axis. So when x varies from negative pi halves to pi halves, and x is an angle, in the unit circle, that varies beginning pointing down and rotating through quadrant 4, and then through quadrant 1 and ends pointing up. Now the graph of our sine function to let x vary from negative pi halves to pi halves means we restrict or crop our sine wave to just this highlighted portion. And as you can see, there's only one such point of intersection on this limited portion of the sine wave, which should be located exactly 2 pi units to the left of 11 pi 6. So we could do 11 pi 6 and remove 2 pi, change 2 pi to 12 pi 6, and then subtract the numerators and we get negative pi 6, which would be this location. And in our unit circle, it simply corresponds to a clockwise rotation from the x-axis by pi 6 radians, or 30 degrees. So our only answer in this case would be x would have to be negative pi 6, or in degrees, negative 30 degrees. Let's keep our radian answer. Okay, moving on. Now the sine function, uncropped, is not a one-to-one -one function because it would fail the horizontal line test. However, if you do crop the sine function to focus only on this portion of it by restricting the values of x, which would be the domain in this case, to angles that vary between negative pi halves and pi halves inclusive, then this orange highlighted portion of the sine wave is a one-to-one -one function and therefore would have an inverse function. Now let's complete this table. We will choose angles between negative pi halves and pi halves, and I will choose angles for which the unit circle will be helpful but there will be one angle for which it will not be helpful. And then we will compute the sine for that angle, which will be the second coordinate in our unit circle. Now I use the word ratio here because the sine of an angle is really the opposite divided by the hypotenuse, and we call that a ratio. So for this function f, keep in mind that f inputs x, which is an angle, and outputs sine of x, which is a ratio. As far as f is concerned, the angle is an x-coordinate, which is the input value, and the opposite divided by hypotenuse, or a ratio, is the y value, or an output value. So the sine of negative pi halves. Let's find negative pi halves in our unit circle. That's rotating clockwise pi halves. That's coterminal with three pi halves. And we focus on that second coordinate. I'm gonna get a negative one. This is the lowest that the sine wave will ever get. Now we do negative pi force. Negative pi force is a clockwise rotation from the x-axis by 45 degrees, or half of pi halves. That would be coterminal with 7 pi force. And looking at the second coordinate right there, we get negative rad 2 over 2. If you turn this into a decimal, it's about negative 0.7. Again, clearly in this interval. If the angle is 0, this angle here, and the second coordinate is also 0. The sine of 0 is 0. Looking out at pi 6, the second coordinate is 1 half. Let's skip 0.8 for a moment and rotate to pi halves, taking us to this position here, and the second coordinate is that 1. And this is the maximum ratio we can get when we do opposite over hypotenuse. Now looking at this graph here, when x, the angle, is negative pi halves, we have an output of negative 1. When x, the angle, was negative pi fourths, we got an output of negative rad 2 over 2. When x is 0, so is y. When x is pi 6, we had an output of 1 half. When x is pi halves, we had a maximum output of 1. So now where does this 0.8 come into play? In decimal form, all of these angles are as follows. So 0.8 would be somewhere between pi 6 and pi halves. And if you reach for a calculator and type in sine of 0.8 and make sure that you are in radian mode, you get approximately 0 0.72. 0 0.8 is roughly in this location, and we have 0.8 comma 0.72. Now because this portion of the sine wave is 1 to 1, we can define an inverse function. For this inverse function, whatever it is, 
The ratios would be the inputs, and the outputs would be angles. The notation for this inverse function is as follows. f inverse of, and now we need to put a variable here, since we're inputting this column, and we call this column y coordinates. Let's go ahead and just say y for now. f inverse of y would be equal to, and then our notation for the inverse of sine is you simply write the sine notation, but put a little negative one power on it, and then put of y. An alternate notation is to write arc sine of y. Now, in reality, the letter that we use for the input variable is arbitrary. I could change all these y's to z's, or to r's that stand for a ratio. Or even, at the risk of causing confusion, I could use x again. But this time, we would want to think of the input, therefore, as an x-coordinate, and the output as maybe the y-coordinate. Well, no matter what letter you put in here, even if that variable is x, you want to remember that the arc sine is an inverse sine function which inputs ratios and outputs angles. This would be a ratio of sides, in this case, opposite divided by hypotenuse. Input ratios, output angles. Let's explore this on the next page. Find the following values by using the unit circle. Give answers in radians and degrees. As soon as you see this sine to the negative one power, this is an inverse sine function, which means that its input is a ratio, and we want to produce an output that's going to be an angle. Let's call this alpha for now. Basically what this is asking us to do is to find the angle alpha at which the sine is rad 3 over 2. So it's just like saying solve sine of alpha equals rad 3 over 2. And alpha must be limited to being an angle from negative pi halves to pi halves because that is how we cropped the sine wave in order to make it a one-to-one -one function. So when using the unit circle to help me do this, I know I'm limiting myself to angles between negative pi halves and rotating counterclockwise to pi halves. So I only get to look at the right side of the unit circle, which is quadrants 4 and 1. And then I start scanning the y-coordinates. And I look for a y-coordinate that's rad 3 over 2, which is here. So my answer in radians would be pi thirds in degrees 60 degrees. When in degrees, make sure that your angle is between negative 90 degrees and positive 90 degrees. So when you're finding the inverse sine of something, you are looking for an angle. And those angles have to be in the fourth and first quadrants. Let's do the next one. When you see this arc sine, that means the exact same thing as seeing a sine to the negative one power like this. They both just mean the inverse sine function. So again, I know I'm looking for some sort of angle. I'll call this beta. And I want to solve sine of beta is equal to negative one half, which is what negative 0.5 is. And furthermore, beta must be an angle in the fourth or first quadrant. So again, scan all the second coordinates of the points along the unit circle that are on the right side of the unit circle and look for that negative one half. And it occurs only once right here. Again, do not look at the second or third quadrants. And that angle, according to the unit circle, is either 11 pi 6 radians or 330 degrees. If you were to put one of these answers down, it would be an invalid answer because it is not in this interval. What you need to do is describe this location by giving a negative co-terminal angle. So instead of giving the answer of rotating counterclockwise 330 degrees, we need to give this co-terminal position by rotating clockwise 30 degrees, or pi 6 radians. So negative pi 6 radians, or by rotating negative 30 degrees. Let's confirm these with technology. Using Desmos, you can type in sine, then as an exponent, put a negative 1, and then put your argument in parentheses. And in the first case, our argument was rad 3 over 2. And furthermore, if you want your answer to be in radians, click the wrench and make sure you have radians selected. Now, the answer it's giving us is a decimal form. And a moment ago, we said that the answer was pi thirds. Notice that both of these expressions have the same decimal representation. This confirms that pi thirds is the correct angle. You can also type arc sine. If you want your answer in degrees, switch over to degrees. And notice it confirms 60 degrees is the correct angle. Let's go back to radians and change my argument to negative 0.5. Notice the answer it gives me. This is a radian measurement. And a moment ago, we said that the answer exactly should be negative pi sixth, confirmed here. Click the wrench and switch to degrees, and notice it gives us the negative 30 degrees. Okay, looking over to the right column, find the following values by using a calculator. Give answers in radians and degrees. So you have arc sine, or inverse sine, or sine to the negative one of, 0.75. Type in arc sine 0.75, go back to radians, and we get 
0.48 approximately. And that's measured in radians. Switch to degree mode, and we get an answer then in degrees of about 48.6. Now what this is telling us is that the sine of approximately 48.6 degrees will give us an opposite over hypotenuse value of 0.75. So again, this is a ratio, specifically opposite over hypotenuse, and the outputs of the inverse sine function are angles, specifically somewhere in the fourth or first quadrant. Arc sine of negative 0.2 in radians is about negative 0.201, and in degrees, about negative 11.5. This is a good time to make an observation that if the argument of an inverse sine function is positive, like 0.75, then the answer we get should be a first quadrant answer, specifically an answer somewhere between 0 and pi halves. That's because it's only in quadrant 1 that we'll have a sine value where the second coordinate will be positive. We're looking back at this graph. If we want a positive output of the sine graph, we need to make sure we pick a first quadrant angle. But if you use an input that's a negative ratio, then we expect to get a quadrant 4 answer, specifically something in the range from negative pi halves up to 0. So in other words, a quadrant 4 answer using a negative angle. Again, the sine has negative values only if we use negative angles that take us into this fourth quadrant. Or in this imagery, if we want a negative output of the sine function, we need to use a negative x-coordinate or a negative angle. Now this last one, arc sine of 1.2. Notice technology gives me undefined. This is because it is not possible for the sine of an angle to be as high as 1.2. Looking at this graph, 1 is the highest that the sine can ever get, and negative 1 is the lowest it can ever get. The sine can only produce ratios that are between negative 1 and 1. Therefore, this expression does not exist, or D and E. This is a good time to draw attention to domain and range of f and f inverse. f was a function that used angles as inputs, and those angles had to be between negative pi halves and pi halves. And then the outputs, which are ratios, needed to be between negative 1 and 1. Now for the inverse function, which is arc sine, the role of domain and range switch. Therefore, the arc sine function has domain of ratios that vary between negative 1 and 1, and a range of angles that vary between negative pi halves and pi halves, or in degrees would be negative 90 degrees to 90 degrees. Okay, next slide. Let's start talking about cosine. Now, like the sine wave, the cosine wave in its entirety is not one-to-one. -one. It fails the horizontal line test. But if you crop it, and we're going to crop this one differently, by limiting your angles to zero to pi, that gives us this portion of the cosine wave which is a one-to-one -one function. It passes both the vertical and the horizontal line test. Therefore, it has an inverse. So in our table over here, I pick several angles that are between zero and pi, and so use the unit circle to calculate the ratio. Of course, in this context, the ratio specifically would be adjacent divided by hypotenuse. The unit circle is the first coordinate that gives us the cosine. So zero degrees is here, and the first coordinate is one. So the cosine of zero is one. Now look at pi six. The first coordinate is rad three over two. And rad 3 over 2 is about 0.87. Let's skip the 0.8 for now because that's not on our unit circle. Pi halves is right here, the top of the unit circle, and the first coordinate is 0. 2 pi thirds is this angle, and the first coordinate is negative 1 half. And then pi points off to the left of the unit circle, and the first coordinate is negative 1. To get the cosine of 0.8, the unit circle is not helpful. Reach for a calculator. Make sure you are in radian mode. And we get about 0.697. In our graph here, all of these points would be as shown here. So again, for the function f, we use angle as the input, and the output is a ratio. But there is an inverse function whose inputs will be the ratio of adjacent over hypotenuse, and whose outputs will be angles between 0 and pi, radians, or 0 and 180 degrees. Again, you can use any input variable you'd like. The inverse function in this case would be the inverse cosine, or cosine to the negative 1, with the argument y. Or you can write arc cosine of y. And once again, the letter you choose to represent the input ultimately does not matter. So sometimes it will go back to x at the risk of causing some confusion. It could all be a. Let's stick with y as our input. And all of these y's represent an input that's a ratio. And that ratio would be in this interval somewhere between negative 1 and 1. And the arc cosine has the domain. It's the ratios that are the inputs. And the range are the outputs which will be angles between 0 and pi, which in degrees would be 0 to 180 degrees. Now these angles, 0 to 180, allow for angles to rotate counterclockwise from 0 halfway around the circle to 180. 
which means we are only now looking at the top half of the unit circle, quadrants 1 and 2. Let's explore this on the next page. Find the following values by using the unit circle. Give answers in radians and degrees. So as soon as you see cosine with a negative 1 power on it, we're talking about inverse cosine, which means that its argument, or its input, is a ratio, specifically adjacent over hypotenuse. So this function should output, or be equal to, some angle. And basically what we're trying to do here is solve the cosine of alpha is equal to 1 half. Furthermore, we have to limit this angle to 0 to pi radians, which is 0 degrees to 180 degrees. So when I'm using the unit circle to explore this, I can only look across the top half of the unit circle. Cosine is the first coordinate, so scan all those points across the top half of the unit circle and look for a first coordinate that's 1 half. It should only happen once, and it occurs right here. That angle is pi thirds, radians, or 60 degrees. Notice pi thirds is in this interval, and 60 degrees is in this interval. Now in the next case, we're trying to find another angle, beta, we'll say, where the cosine of beta is negative rad 2 over 2. And of course, we must limit ourselves. Beta has to be an angle somewhere in the first and second quadrants. So scanning the top half of the unit circle, looking for a first coordinate that's negative rad 2 over 2. It should happen only once. It occurs right here at 3 pi force radians or 135 degrees. Again, do not look down here in the third or fourth quadrants when calculating inverse cosine outputs. So that angle beta in radians would be 3 pi fourths, or in degrees, 135 degrees. Okay, the next column over, find the following values by using a calculator. Give answers in radians and degrees. Let's begin with the inverse cosine of 0.75. In Desmos, I'm going to type in arc cosine, but you can also type in cosine to the negative 1. Make sure you're in radian mode, and we get the arc cosine of 0.75 is about 0.723. And then switch to degree mode, and that's about 41.4 degrees. In summary, the cosine of 0.723 radians, or about 41.4 degrees, when you do adjacent divided by hypotenuse, you would get 0.75, or 3 quarters. Let's do arc cosine of negative 0.25, or negative a quarter. In radian mode would be about 1.823, and then switch to degree mode, which is about 104.5 degrees. Now, when you're doing inverse cosine and you have a positive ratio, so the ratio is more than zero, then your answer should be a quadrant one angle. In other words, it has to be somewhere between zero and pi halves. But when your argument of an arc cosine is negative, then our angle needs to be a quadrant two angle or something between pi halves and pi. That was not true for arc sine. The arc sine of a negative number was a quadrant four angle using a negative angle to get there. Now, of course, the ratio must be between negative 1 and 1, but this negative 3.2 is not in that interval. So this expression does not exist. There's no angle at which the cosine will be below negative 1 or above positive 1. All right, and this concludes part 1 out of three parts on our discussion about inverse trigonometry.